uh, here at Long Meadow, you're very welcome as we gather together to listen to God's Word, to pray to Him, to sing our praises, uh, and to see more of who the Lord Jesus is. Let me read to you from the beginning of Psalm 89. It says this, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you've established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I've made a covenant with my chosen one. I've sworn to David, my servant, I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. The heavens praise your wonders, Lord, your faithfulness to in the assembly of the Holy One. For who in the skies above can compare with the Lord? Who is like the Lord among the heavenly beings? In the council of the holy ones, God is greatly feared. He is more awesome than all who surround him. Who is like you, Lord God Almighty? You, Lord, are mighty and your faithfulness surrounds you. We're going to marvel together at the wonder of who this great God is as we sing our opening song. Uh, if you're able, do stand and let's sing our praise and wonder to God. Father, we thank you that you are indeed the king of all the earth, that you reign supreme over all things, those things in our lives which are wonderful at the moment and those things which are difficult. We thank you that you stand supreme and that you have us uh, in your hands. And so we pray that this morning you would turn our, our gaze once more on your might and on your power, but also on your mercy and your grace, as we recognize that you are the one who stepped down from your throne to have nails driven through your hands as you've paid the price for our sin. Thank you for the wonder of your grace and mercy alongside your power and your majesty. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to continue uh, in this next hymn with our, uh, in our praise of the greatness of God.
thing about the greatness of God, as we've already hinted at, is that it is supremely shown to us in his love and his compassion. Both those first two songs have reminded us of this wonderful truth, the one who felt nails upon his hands, bearing the guilt of sinful men and women, you and me. The God who promises to rescue his people, the God whose mercy is sure. The God who has said he has redeemed us and washed us clean. As we were thinking about a couple of weeks ago in uh, in Joshua chapter 5. The one whose word we can trust as he declares us made right. So in this next song, we're gazing in wonder at all he has done for us. Let's sing together. Lead us in prayers of praise at this wondrous mystery we've just been celebrating. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. And Lord, we want to lift your name on high. We want to thank you for the works you've done in our lives. Lord, we trust in your unfailing love. For you alone are God. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus, that because you rose, we can be confident that we will one day rise to Amen. Amen. Amen.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for grace unmeasured, for love untold. We thank you for the way in which you have begun to open our eyes to see the immensity of your grace and love towards us. And we ask that you would thrill us further with that this morning, from the youngest of us to the oldest, that we might see and know your love for us and your rescue of us and the future that you have awaiting us. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you please take a seat? Let me tell you about a few things coming up over the next uh, couple of weeks or so. Eyes down for a full house today. There will be a test later on. Not really, although maybe. Uh, this afternoon, we start our next uh, Forum at Five uh, series, thinking about how we share this wonderful good news, this wondrous mystery with those uh, around. And this, uh, this afternoon at five o'clock, we're going to be thinking particularly about how we share that uh, with those who come from an Eastern Orthodox uh, background. If you're able to be here at five, uh, that would be great to come and join us. Uh, the service, that, uh, that um, seminar will be live streamed, so you can catch it if you're at home. You'll get more if you're here uh, and able to join in some of the discussions that go on in small groups. But if you can't make it here, you can join via the live stream with the usual uh, link uh, this afternoon. Uh, we're also starting up uh, soon a, a men's Zoom book group where we're going to read through a, a book together, just for 45 minutes or so, once a, a fortnight or so. Uh, as, uh, as guys uh, gathering together on Zoom. If you're interested in being part of that, to find, to find out more, uh, go and talk to James uh, Thompson, James Give a Wave, um, and uh, he'll, uh, you can join the WhatsApp group and we'll discuss a time that was good for all of us to meet up uh, then. Uh, then uh, next Sunday, uh, it's October already, uh, next Sunday, uh, it's great Graham and Nock Dalrymple with Joseph and Sam, our mission partners in South Thailand, are joining us. Uh, for the morning uh, service, and we're going to have uh, a bring and share lunch uh, after that when they'll be sharing some more and we'll be able to pray for them uh, and for their work. So do stick that in your diaries um, and do come along if you're able to. If you're able to bring some hot food, uh, talk to Steph uh, over here. If you're able to bring some cold food or dessert, still talk to Steph because he's really nice to be helpful to know what's coming. Um, and then we can make sure we've got enough and we don't just have lots and lots of salad and no chocolate because that would be really bad. Um, so that's next Sunday. Uh, do stay if you're able. If you're not able to uh, bring any food, that's fine. You just come and stay and you eat and that's okay. Um, and we hear more about Graham and Knox work. That's next weekend. Then the weekend after that, Saturday the 19th, across at Graham's Baptist uh, in Letchworth. Uh, good news for everyone, um, formerly called the, the Gideons. Uh, we'll be sharing some news, an opportunity to hear some stories about what's been going on with that work between 12 and 1.30 ever at Grange Baptist, and there's a buffet lunch uh, there as well. So if you're able to go for that, you don't have to take anything for that one, but you do need to talk to Martin or Gillian. Give us a wave. Martin's in the cabin at the back. Um, uh, if you'd like to come along to that, just so they know uh, numbers for that. So that's Saturday the 19th. Then, Saturday the 26th is the light party, four till six uh, here at church, where we uh, invite primary school children along, so be inviting friends and neighbours uh, school friends, that kind of thing, along to that. Lots of fun and the opportunity to hear what uh, the light of the world brings uh, to us all. If you're able to help with some of the activities for that, that would be great. Do talk to Gemma or Miriam over there. If you haven't waved yet, give a wave at the end of the notice just so that you don't feel left out. Um, if you're able to help with that, do speak to one of them. We also need chocolate coins for prizes, is that right? And there will be a box somewhere in the back there next week for you to bring them in and pop them in there. Um, that doesn't mean you can go and help yourself to chocolate coins. I'm thinking about you adults, not children. And then uh, the Tuesday after that is our next community lunch on the 29th of October. And then last but not least, um, Christmas is approaching because it's October. Um, and Christmas provides a great opportunity to share the good news of Jesus with uh, primary school aged children. And so uh, the Christmas journey run by Bridge Builders is going ahead uh, as usual uh, this year. Um, if you're able to help with volunteering with that, um, getting dressed up in costumes and telling the story to the children, it's great fun to do. Um, there are three churches hosting in Stevenage. Um, there are details in the notices uh, about that, but between Monday the 25th of November and the, uh, Friday the 29th, it's going on at St. Peter's just around the corner and at St. Nick's. And the following week, the 2nd to the 6th of December, it's at St. Hugh and St. John. If you're able to uh, help with some of that, uh, then do get in contact. The details are in the notice emails, or you can come and talk to, uh, to Steph um, or to Gemma about that. In fact, Gemma, why don't you, at this point, 
come up the front. Um, Gemma, you've got a new job, which would be good to hear about. Gemma, what's your new job? Tell us all uh, about it. I am now working for Bridge Builders to do um, assemblies and help with Christmas journey Christmas admin journey. <laughs> and things. So what does that mean you're doing? What, what does an assembly look like? When uh, so they usually uh, 10 to 15 minutes in schools, um, getting children out to do stuff and telling a Bible story and sharing a bit of the good news with them. And when did you start all that? Uh, I started in July, but I haven't been doing assembly since September. Okay, so. yeah. And um, what are you most excited about about this new job? Uh, I'm excited about the assemblies. Actually, that's good. Um, I I think I benefited from having a Christian head teacher when I was at primary school, and definitely his assemblies were better because he had uh, a love of God that came across. So, yeah, I'm hoping I can do similar. <laughs> yeah. And what are you nervous about? <laughs> nervous thing? about. Christmas Admin. journey. <laughs> <laughs> we had a lovely meeting, didn't we, Steph? It was great, and there was a lot to do. So, yeah, that's um, not technically my job, but I'm supporting the lady that's doing that, okay. and there's a lot. So, yeah, yeah that's good. Um, I'm sure she appreciates the yeah. support. Um, any encouragement so far that you can share with us? Um, yeah, I've met some lovely volunteers. When when I go, I don't often go on my own. I meet um, with some other volunteers that help the bridge build, and they've been doing it for years. So, I met some really lovely people. Um, yeah, and then people that have been doing it for so long, I think it's always an encouragement when people have been working at something for a really long time um, but still have that love and that joy and want to share still. So that's yeah. really encouraging. And what can we particularly pray for you at the moment? Um, that. <laughs> share, yeah. <laughs> that. Um, and yeah, just, um, just that there'll be seeds planted. I know I probably won't see anything happening with what I with the little bit that I go in and do but yeah just for seeds to be planted in children's hearts around Stevenage would be, yes. would be great good should we take a seat because I know you'll be on the stage let's pray for Gemma shall we father we thank you so much for the work of bridge builders which has gone on uh, for so many years thank you for all the children uh, over those years who have heard something of the good news of the Lord Jesus in assemblies and at Christmas journey and at Easter journey and we do pray for the ongoing work of Bridge Builders, that you would give great wisdom to all those uh, who are running it for uh, trustees and staff. Uh, we pray too that the doors would remain open to be able to go into schools um, and run uh, assemblies and lessons uh, sometimes and, uh, and uh, run the Christmas journey and the Easter journey too. And thank you for calling uh, Gemma to this work. Thank you uh, for the encouragements that she's already enjoyed of uh, um, being able to plant seeds in the lives of some of those children, but also seeing the way in which your people have remained faithful over so many years in uh, this ministry uh, to, uh, to young children uh, here in Stevenage. Lord, we want to pray uh, for her going forward that you would continue to give her fresh ideas for assemblies, that you give her patience with some of the admin that comes with things like the Christmas journey, that you give her an increasing love for the children that she meets with um, and a passion to share with them about the good news of who Jesus is. And we pray particularly for the Christmas journey itself. And we ask, Lord, that you would provide the volunteers that are needed to run uh, that, that journey. We pray for all the, uh, the, uh, the children and the staff who come along, that they might be caught up with the wonder of God become man to rescue us. Lord, we ask that uh, seeds planted there would, would uh, bear fruit uh, in the near future and in the distant future as people come to know you as uh, children and teachers see the wonder of who Jesus is. So please be at work through all of that, uh, we pray. And we ask too that you be at work uh, through the light party that we uh, run in a couple of weeks uh, here uh, at church. We pray that there be many children coming along to that, to that, to hear the wonder of Jesus, uh, the light of the world. And for the other opportunities that we have, both to build relationships through things like the, uh, the community lunch and to hear the good news uh, of what's going on uh, around the country, uh, with good news for everyone, and also around the world as Graham and Knock visit us next weekend. We ask that you would uh, encourage us and spur us on as we're part of that in our local uh, neighbourhoods and the front lines where you placed us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we share this great good news of the mercy of God, and we recognise that as we do so, that all of us are in need of that mercy. And it's that mercy that we celebrate in this next song. But as we sing and we celebrate God's mercy towards us, we also ask too that God would help each one of us to shine for him before a watching world that others might see and know this great God for themselves too. If you're able, do stand. Let's sing together.
And Father, we thank you that because the Lord Jesus has conquered the grave, we need no longer fear death, but we are safe uh, with you. Please remind us more of that, uh, all of us uh, in this building, we pray, as we, uh, as we listen to your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, it's time now for the children to head to their groups uh, out through the back there. And while they do that, why don't you take the opportunity to say hello to someone who's sitting nearby. <clears throat> We'll take that as a positive thing that Johnny would like to stay in the service with us. <laughs> We've been reflecting this morning on the greatness of God and the way in which that greatness uh, is shown in his love and mercy towards us. And you'll remember that we saw a couple of weeks ago in our series uh, in Joshua uh, that we're reminded uh, or we're encouraged to trust the promise of God. The promise of God that he has us, that he has done enough to forgive our sin uh, in the Lord Jesus. And so that's what we remind ourselves of today as we come uh, to the Lord's table once more. We remind ourselves of the promise of God that it is done, it is finished, that we are forgiven and we are made right with him. Uh, if those who are serving communion could come and uh, join me at the front. If you've trusted the Lord Jesus, then no matter what your past week has been like, whether you have been uh, immensely faithful to him over this past week or stumbled and fallen many times, it matters not because he has you and he holds you and he has dealt with your sin. And so therefore you are able to take the bread and the juice and, to do, and as you do so, recognize the wonder of his grace and love towards you as you confess your sin and as you receive uh, his forgiveness. Actually, that's each and every one of us here in the building, isn't it? We've all messed up uh, this past week, and yet still he has us. If you've trusted him, believe his promise that he has forgiven you. If you've not yet trusted him as your saviour and lord yourself, then do please just let the bread and juice pass on by, unless you decide in the next couple of minutes, yes, I want to know the wonder of God's forgiveness, and you commit yourself to him, in which case you too can take bread and juice with great joy, along with the rest of us. The bread is all gluten-free, uh, so do feel free to join in if you have uh, any allergies. Looking at the numbers of pieces here, I'm slightly nervous that we're not quite going to get round. So if you're a couple, you might want to take a piece and break it into two between the two of you, just to make sure. And when it all comes back and there's loads left over, you'll know I was just being paranoid, but that's okay. Um, we can share and share alike. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you for your amazing uh, grace unmeasured love untold towards us. We thank you for the way in which we see that supremely in the Lord Jesus and his gift of himself in our place, his gift of his righteousness in exchange for our sin. And so we pray that as we take bread and juice, for many of us for the umpteenth time today, that we might once again trust your word, trust your promise, and know the glory of being your forgiven children. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So do please uh, take the bread as you're offered uh, and eat it there and then. Uh, with thankful hearts.
One of the reasons I suspect sometimes we doubt God's promise is because we start playing that comparison game once again. And we look around at everyone else whose lives are so sorted and who are so good and think, well, I don't match up to them and therefore I must be in some way substandard. Why would God ever be interested in me when he's got all these other wonderful individuals around? Well, as we drink juice together, we are reminded that we stand together in the grace of Christ. That each of us, under whatever mask we might put on on the surface, needs a saviour. Everyone needs compassion. And the glorious good news is that Lord Jesus has compassion on each and every one of us. And so we stand together as forgiven people. So hold on to your glasses. We'll drink together as we remember that we are forgiven together by the glory of the grace of Christ.
These are the words we're going to sing together to one another in just a moment as we remember that we uh, have a strong and certain plea before the, the throne of God because he has given himself in our place. And that's what we remember as we drink together. So let's stand and declare to one another the wonder of the greatness of what God has done and the security that we have in him. Let's stand together. Father, we thank you for this great good news of what the Lord Jesus has done for us. And we pray that in the security of what he has done, of the knowledge of what you are like because you have come to rescue us for yourself, help us to be those who listen now to your word with humility and respond in obedience. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you please take a seat? We're continuing our series in the book of Joshua. Um, we're picking up at Joshua chapter 5 and verse 13. We're on page 219 if you're using one of the, the church Bibles. There are times when we come across passages in Scripture which, frankly, make us feel uncomfortable. Ideas or events that don't sit very easily with us, which, brings up, which bring up questions that perhaps we would rather not face. There are some of us, I guess, in those situations who hear those questions and metaphorically put our fingers in our ears and sing loudly. Basically, we ignore them and we pretend they're not there. The trouble with that is, of course, that they are there and we know it. And so we're left with a, with a nagging uncertainty as we ignore these things, a fear that everything may come crashing down around our ears if we look too closely at these difficult questions that we might have. Others of us love a bit of controversy, and so we're happy to talk to anyone and everyone about those things. But if controversy is all we're after, we still don't really engage with those questions properly. We don't wrestle with them, we just kind of skim across the surface, causing havoc to all those around us by what we loudly declare. Neither of those approaches actually takes God's word seriously. It makes it something either something awkward to be dodged, or a conversational football to be kicked around. Neither of it allows it to challenge and to question us. 
And neither um, approaches it with the, with the humility that means we may actually have to wrestle and struggle with it as we work out what it means to listen and to obey. Uh, there are some difficult questions that arise in our passage today in the book of Joshua. I imagine you'll probably spot them as we read them through. But let's come and listen to God's word together this morning. Joshua chapter 5, verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out and no one came in. Then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the armor will go up, everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, Advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the Ark. All this time the trumpets were sounding. But Joshua had commanded the army, Do not give a war cry, do not raise your voices, do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. So we had the Ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once. Then the army returned to camp and spent the night there. Joshua got up early the next morning and the priests took up the Ark of the Lord and the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the Ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them and the rear guard followed the Ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak and marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priest sounded the trumpet blast, blast, Joshua commanded the army, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab the prostitute and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she hid the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise you will make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the army shouted, and at the sound of the trumpet, when the men gave a loud sh shout, the wall collapsed. So everyone charged straight in and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep and donkeys. Joshua said to the two men who had spied out the land, Go into the prostitute's house and bring her out and all who belong to her in accordance with your oath to her. So the young men who had done the spying went in and brought out Rahab, her father and mother, her brothers and sisters and all who belonged to her. They brought out her entire family and put them in a place outside the camp of Israel. Then they burned the whole city and everything in it. But they put the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron into the treasury of the Lord's house. But Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute with her family and all who belonged to her, because she hid the men Joshua had sent as spies to Jericho, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. At that time, Joshua pronounced this solemn curse. Cursed before the Lord is the one who undertakes to rebuild this city, Jericho. At the cost of his firstborn son, he will lay its foundations. At the cost of his youngest, he will set up its gates. So the Lord was with Joshua, and his fame spread throughout the land. Well, let's name the issue that I think confronts us before we go any further. It's God's command to destroy Jericho and everything in it. 
Although, of course, at that point, we've already gone beyond what the text says, haven't we? Because not everything and everyone is destroyed. We do need to pay careful attention to what we read. But nevertheless, it is true to say that with one clear exception, the total destruction of Jericho does take place. And it is what God says must happen. And so we're presented here with the consequences of the conquest of the promised land for those already living there. We'll think about that in a few minutes. And then, of course, I think all of this is thrown into sharper relief in the light of the current situation in this same part of our world today that we see on our news screen. And perhaps the way that some Christians are talking about it. Despite my best efforts, I don't see how we can address Joshua chapter 6 without making reference to the current situation in Israel, Gaza and Lebanon. So we'll get there in a moment. I hope with due humility and care. But we're going to start elsewhere. Because we mustn't miss how this event fits in with the bigger story that this book is telling us. The story of the gracious activity of God to fulfill his promises of rescue and blessing. So amidst everything else and all those other questions that we have and that we will deal with, don't miss this. God fights the battle to bring his people to his place. God fights the battle to bring his people to his place. You might recall the children's song that did the rounds many moons ago. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Except, of course, he didn't, did he? There was no battle at Jericho. The city fell after the people walked around it for a week and then gave a loud shout. The walls just fell. Look at what God says before the whole thing starts. Verse 2, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands. I have delivered Jericho into your hands. Notice then in the instructions, there is the, the prominence of the Ark of the Covenant in all that follows. It's the, it's the Ark that leads the people around the city, isn't it? The symbol of the presence of God is front and center throughout. Just as it was, you remember, in the crossing of the Jordan, another seemingly impossible barrier that faced God's people. See, in the, in the bigger story of the fulfillment of God's promises, we are seeing here that once again it is God who does the work. It is God who rescues his people. It is God who defeats their enemies. It is God who will give them rest in the place that he has promised them. It is always God who acts. And of course, all of this looks forward to the ultimate fulfillment of his promises in Jesus that we celebrated earlier, where it is God who deals with our sin himself, so that our death and stain are removed, not our good behavior to offset on the great scales. It is God who defeats our greatest enemy, death itself, as the sun rises from the dead and gives us new life. It is God who opens our eyes by his Spirit to see who Jesus is, who leads us to repentance and faith, not our our wisdom or our insight. It is God who keeps us on the journey and leads us all the way home to the place that he's prepared for. God does the work. God fights the battle. And so we place our trust in him and enjoy his grace and mercy. And there's one little detail in this story that I think drives that home once more because Six days, the Israelites marched once round the city. And on the seventh day, we know the story, they did so seven times, and they gave their shout, and the down tumbled the walls. On the seventh day. Now, you can't use a phrase in the Old Testament like the seventh day without immediately associating that in everyone's minds with the Sabbath, with the day of rest, when you did no work, the seventh day. And it is on that day, the seventh day, that God brings the walls of Jericho down. Because he was doing the work, wasn't he? It's God who rescues his people and gives them rest. See, everything else that we think about this morning as we wrestle with some of the difficult questions to come, don't miss, don't miss the big picture of God's gracious actions on behalf of his people. And supremely he has done that in the Lord Jesus, who is our great champion, 
the one who has fought our battle for us and won it, so that we ride his coattails all the way through to glory. But let's turn now to this difficult question of harem. That's the Hebrew word translated here as devoted to the Lord in verses 17 and 21. It's also been called the ban. It's the, it's the command not just to, to conquer here, but to destroy. So what are we to make then of what seems on the face of it to be a barbaric instruction? Well, first of all, there's nothing wrong with being shocked and uncomfortable with this idea as we read it through. If it sat easily with us, I think there will be deeper questions to ask about our level of compassion uh, towards others. But secondly, we must not just dismiss it as something either mistaken that sneaked in here or just plain wrong, the product of a, a misguided earlier age. Now, instead, we need to take God's word seriously and we need to wrestle with it with appropriate humility. We don't sit in judgment on it or on God and what he chooses to do. But I think what we need to do uh, to begin with is to see that in the conquest of the promised land, there are two things that are going on here. One is the gift of the land to Israel, just as God had promised. It's a place of blessing and and rest for his people. That links with all that we've already been talking about, as we uh, are thinking about as God fights the battle, as God does the work to fulfill his promises. That's one thing that's going on here. But there is something else that is going on here which is equally consistent with God and his character. In the gift of the land, we see his grace and his mercy, but in the destruction of the Canaanites, we see his judgment against evil. See, we are gravely mistaken if we view the Canaanites as innocent victims in this whole situation. In fact, actually, this is a judgment which has been some 400 years in the making. You go back to Genesis chapter 15, where God reiterates his covenant there with Abraham, a covenant promise which includes the land in which he was then living, Canaan. But God told him it would be 400 years before his descendants would return to the land and possess it. Genesis 15, verse 16. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. The Amorites is a reference to the inhabitants of Canaan. And God sees here that their sinfulness and wickedness will only increase down through the generations so that when the time comes for him to take Israel back into the land, they will do so as part of God's judgment on the wickedness of the inhabitants who live there. And we get a brief insight into the wickedness of those inhabitants in the book of Deuteronomy when Moses warns the people there to avoid following the practices of that land. He says this, When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or is a medium or a spirit or still and consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. Because of these same detestable practices, the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. Did you hear the opening line there? Do not sacrifice your son or daughter to the fire. That's what the Canaanites did. That's what the Canaanites did. Child sacrifices were a regular and accepted part of their culture. Think for just a moment about how you feel when you hear stories of child abuse and mistreatment on the news particularly when that is systematic and ongoing. Is there not an anger that rightly boils inside us when the vulnerable are mistreated, when damage is done to precious children in that way? Child sacrifice is a part of Canaanite culture, accepted and practiced. And God comes in searing judgment against it. You begin to see the bigger picture of what is happening here the goodness, the rightness of God's judgment that is being carried out at Jericho. These are not innocent victims. The declaration of harem, of the ban against the inhabitants at Jericho, 
has actually nothing to do with uh, Israel and her need for land. It is everything to do with God's justice being done and with evil being ended. Unless we or the Israelites be tempted to confuse that, Moses reminded the Israelites of this uh, in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 9. After the Lord your God has driven them out before you, do not say to yourself, the Lord has brought me here to take possession of this land because of my righteousness. No. It is on account of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is going to drive them out before you. It is not because of your righteousness or your integrity that you are going in to take possession of their land, but on account of the wickedness of these nations, the Lord your God will drive them out before you to accomplish what he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. And there's one final thing for us to note here. And it comes in that curious encounter that Joshua has in chapter 5 and verses 13 to 15. Now there's been much debate as to who this figure is, this commander of the army of the Lord. Is he some mighty angel or or is this God himself, a a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus? Well, opinion differs and we can debate it for ages. But there there are two things that would make me begin to lean towards this being a divine encounter. Firstly, because when Joshua falls down in reverence, in worship, the figure does not correct him. When John the Apostle falls in worship before a mighty uh, angel in Revelation 19, verse 10, the angel is quick to correct him and to tell him to worship God instead. And secondly, this figure tells Joshua to take off his sandals because he is standing on holy ground which you might remember mirrors Moses' encounter with God at the burning bush. Now, you can make your own mind on that, but what I want us to see here today is what this, uh, this figure says in answer to Joshua's opening question. Are you for us or for our enemies? Now, aren't we expecting him to say something along the lines here of, I've come to fight for you, Joshua. I've come to fight for you as the commander of the army of the Lord. I'm on your side. But he doesn't, does he? In fact, he he explicitly says, I am not on your side. I am the commander of the army of the Lord. The army of the Lord acts for the Lord, not for those who claim him as their God of choice. He has come to do God's work not Joshua's or Israel's. And God's work here is the gift of the land to Israel, but it is also his judgments on the wickedness of the Canaanites. Now let me pause here before we go any further to address that question of of reading a passage like this uh, in the light of all we currently see going on in the Middle East. Uh, in the light of what we, what we read here and the, um, the old covenant promises of a, of a land for Israel, how then do we look at the events that we currently see unfolding in that part of the world today? Well, of course, we can't possibly do justice to a, a topic of such complexity in a, in a few minutes this morning, but here are a few things I think we can say. Firstly, and I think really importantly, the judgment of Joshua chapter 6 on the Canaanite tribes driving them out of the land of Canaan was a unique, specific, historical act of judgment by God that was, as we saw in Genesis 15, some 400 years in the making. And I think the uniqueness of that act of judgment is also shown by the curse that Joshua proclaims over Jericho at the end of the the chapter. That doesn't happen again later on. So I think because this is a unique, specific historical act of judgment, there is no justification for drawing parallel lines to the situation in the present day. We are not at liberty to do that. Secondly, no land anywhere, either today or in Scripture, is gifted to one ethnic people to the exclusion of all others. The Old Testament itself, made, made a law, made much of the importance of the welcome of the alien and the stranger. That principle remains in the New Testament under the New Covenant. And I might add at this point that this applies as much to us in the West and our attitude to immigrants to this country as much as it applies to the difficult situation in the Middle East. 
the language of them and us, of look after your own first, is profoundly unchristian. Thirdly, and I recognize that there are different view, differing views on this, it seems to me that as the new covenant supersedes the old with the coming of Jesus, it does so across the whole board on all matters. So the promise of a specific land on earth for a people is never picked up in the New Testament. It is totally absent. Instead, it is replaced by the ultimate place of rest that God promises, the new heavens and the new earth. That's the fulfillment of the rest that we have in Christ. So in my understanding, the old covenant was always a shadow of what was to come in Christ. All God's promises are yes in him. So the, the, the Passover and with it the sacrificial system, which was so significant and central to old covenant faith and practice, was only a shadow of what was to come in Jesus and his death and resurrection. So we no longer look to the shadow and celebrate the Passover, but to its greater fulfillment and reality, and we celebrate at the Lord's table. The high priest and his duties were a picture of what Christ would do. So now we look to him, the one mediator, and the high priestly office is gone. There is no human mediator between us and God, except the man, Jesus Christ, who is also God. We could say the same about the temple. And the same, I think, about the land. We do not look for a place in the here and now, because a place in the here and now will always be tainted by sin and struggle. That will never give the rest and peace that we long for and that God has promised. Instead, we look to a restored creation where we dwell together as one people, Jew and Gentile, united in Christ. So what implications does all this have then for how we watch the news? Well, I think, therefore, that we view the current situation in the Middle East not through the lens of Old Testament promises, which in any case point to Christ and are fulfilled in him. Rather, we look at it through the lens of how human beings should treat one another with kindness and compassion, with selflessness and love, and of the tragedy that comes when we don't do that. See, we live in a broken, messed up, hurting world. And we see that on our news screens night after night, on both sides of the story. And it should bring us to tears and to our knees. We also live in a rebellious and wicked world. And we see that on our news screens night after night, on both sides of the story. And it should make us sad and angry that God is defied in what we see and so bring us to our knees, asking that the Spirit would bring repentance and change and faith to other sinners who are just like us. But let's return to Joshua chapter 6 and uh, finish wrestling with this issue of the, the heron and the judgment. Because even with the recognition of the wickedness exemplified by child's sacrifice of these tribes, this it's still a difficult thing for us to come to terms with, isn't it? But judge, God's judgment is real, and it is serious. And there's no getting away from the issue by some reference to, oh, but this is the God of the Old Testament. I much prefer the God of the New Testament. You see, aside from the fact that the God of the Old Testament, and again and again we see God's love and grace displayed in the Old Testament, in fact, the whole fact that there is a history to be written after humanity's first rebellion against him is a sign of his grace and mercy. And that's before you even get to the myriad of instances in the Old Testament of his kindness and compassion, his rescue plan, his patience with a fickle people, and so on and so forth. Aside from all that, you go to the New Testament and you find it is Jesus who talks about the reality of hell and judgment. God's final devastating judgment on wickedness, more than anyone else in the whole Bible. It's an entirely false distinction made between Old and New Testaments. You can't do that. It just doesn't work. God's judgment is real, and it is uncomfortable, and so it should be. But actually, sometimes it's uncomfortable, even to some extent, to God himself. Listen to his appeal to rebellious sinners in Ezekiel 33. As surely as I live, declares the Sovereign Lord, I take no pleasure in the death of the wicked, 
but rather that they turn from their wicked, from their ways and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways. Why will you die, people of Israel? But it's also true to say that God's judgment is part of his goodness. Because goodness must be unreservedly opposed to wickedness. Otherwise it's not good at all. It's morally ambivalent. See, there's a reason why we cry for justice when we see or hear stories of of violence or corruption or abuse or manipulation or oppression because those things are evil and they deserve punishment. God's judgment is real and it is also uncomfortable. But remarkably, in the light of the seriousness of sin, God's patience is also real. And we saw it today in our passage today, if you uh, look. Firstly, there's God's patience for 400 years before this judgment finally fell. He saw the trajectory of these Canaanite tribes way back in Genesis chapter 15, but he waited and he waited and he waited. 400 years of pain for God as he watched people being hurt and damaged and killed by one another we might easily actually end up with a question, why so long, God, before you brought this judgment? 400 years when the Canaanites could have changed their ways, seen the evil of their practices, done something different. God gave them 400 years of chances. And then secondly, he gave them another week, didn't he? A week for them to reflect on their situation. A week while Joshua and the people walked around the city but did not attack. A week where they could think about what they knew about this invading people. And they knew. Remember Rahab's words from chapter 2? I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us. So that all who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. We have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt. And what you did to Sion and Og, the two kings of the Amorites east of the Jordan whom you completely destroyed. When we heard of it, our hearts melted in fear and everyone's courage failed because of you. For the Lord your God is God in heaven above and on earth below. See, they'd seen something of who God is. They knew it. There was a week. A week where they could surrender and acknowledge the true and living God. And they did nothing. And then, of course, there's the story of Rahab, isn't there? Rahab and all her household, because not everyone in Jericho was placed under her end. Three times in our short passage, our attention is drawn to Rahab, and frequently, too, we're reminded that she was a prostitute. So it's not like the respectable upper classes, the well-to-do, are being spared. Three times in our short passage, our attention is drawn her way, and Rahab is spared. Why? Well, we just heard it in what she said, didn't we? Because she recognized who was really God and she threw herself on his mercy. Which brings us back to where we started, doesn't it? And God's determined plan to rescue and bless those who don't deserve it. And who will do so by his action, not by their hard work or merit. See, there's one of the key applications to each one of us today. In the light of God's goodness, which is implacably opposed to all evil, from the monstrous wickedness of the Canaanites to the attitudes and actions and words that we use which put self first and cause harm to others, and most of all ignore God himself. In the light of God's goodness, which is implacably opposed to all wrongdoing, and which will one day bring his judgment on all that wrongdoing. Throw yourself on his mercy. Throw yourself on his mercy and do so with joy and with relief because of how good and kind he is, because he is the rescuing God. The God who rescues at the greatest cost to himself. And he is patient still. Still he extends a hand of welcome and forgiveness to each and every one of us. Don't miss out on his offer of life. 
don't miss out on his offer of life. Today is the day of salvation. And what a salvation it is. See, Rahab is spared because she trusted in God's grace and mercy in the light of his coming judgment on wickedness. And she's not just spared. She's welcomed into God's people. More than that, she is honoured amongst God's people. She is honoured by God himself. Because this isn't the last we're going to hear of Rahab. <clears throat> this isn't the last we're going to hear of Rahab. She's going to crop up again in Matthew chapter 1, verse 5. Where we find uh, that God has made her part of the family line of his son. The one in whom he will fulfill all of his promises and he will, where he will demonstrate his grace and his mercy, rescue his people and make them his own honouring them, honouring us, far beyond our wildest imagination. Let's pray together. Father God, we are keenly aware of the brokenness of our world. We see it on our new screens, night after night after night. We see it in our own hearts, day after day after day. And we are glad that you stand opposed to all wickedness. We are glad that one day you will put an end to it. We thank you that you are good enough to punish what is evil. But Lord, we recognize too that that leaves us in great uh, peril, except for the fact that the Lord Jesus has taken that judgment on himself and so set us free. And so we thank you for the honour you have placed on us by making us not simply part of your people, but part of your family, your sons and daughters, children of the King. Help us to trust in the wonder of what you have done for us. And as we do so, Lord, please give us our hatred of sin in our own lives, that we might long with the, by the power of your Spirit that we might become more like the Lord Jesus that we might say no to our selfish desires and instead pursue uh, the likeness of the Lord Jesus. And Lord, we pray to you that we would hate the sin that we see around in the world too. And that that would make us prayerful for your justice and your mercy and your peace, for change of hearts and minds, for repentance and faith. And Lord, as we watch our news screens night after night, Help us not to be those who turn away, but that be those who have compassion and who are driven to our knees to pray for relief from suffering and for repentance from sin. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing as we close our service uh, today, fixing our thoughts once more on our great champion, on the Lord Jesus and looking forward to one day being home with him. If you're able, please stand. Let's celebrate our great salvation. <laughs>
Father God, we pray that you would fix our eyes more and more on your Son and his beauty and his wonder in the midst of a dark and difficult world. Uh, thrill our hearts with the wonder of the Saviour and help us to be those who show him to others, that they too might know the joy of his forgiveness, his grace and his mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please take a seat. Thank you.